Welcome everyone to tonight's virtual open house. My name is Kelsey. I'm a community liaison officer with Mayflower Wind and I will be your moderator for tonight's event. First, I'd just like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your evening to join us tonight to learn more about the Mayflower Wind South Coast project and our activities in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. We had over 200 registrants for tonight's event, most of you coming from the Portsmouth community or adjacent Rhode Island community, and we're grateful for such a great turnout. Thank you also to the elected officials, as well as local and state agency members in the audience who made the time to join us. As a reminder, this event is exclusively focused on Mayflower Wind South Coast project, and we will be focusing on addressing questions coming from the Portsmouth and neighboring municipality community members. This is the fifth event in our open house series titled The Future of Clean Energy is Here. Here is tonight's agenda. We will begin with the need for offshore wind in New England and how climate change is driving the clean energy transition. We will then go into a high level overview of the Mayflower Wind South Coast project with a specific focus on Mayflower's planned activities in Portsmouth and Rhode Island state waters. From there, we'll transition away from the slides and take a brief flyover tour of the export cable corridor and route options through Portsmouth using Mayflower Wind's 3D visualization tool. After that quick tour, we'll dive back into the economic benefits to the region and to Portsmouth. There will be two opportunities during the event to ask questions. You may submit questions at any time by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I will be using first names when reading the questions. If you do not want your first name to be mentioned, please note that when sending your question in. And here are tonight's speakers. As mentioned, I will be moderating tonight's event. We have our South Coast Community Liaison Officer Dugan Becker with us tonight as our main speaker. He will also be driving the 3D visualization tool behind the scenes. We have our Transmission Development Manager, Lawrence Mott, as our second main tour guide. Um, second main speaker and tour guide. And lastly, we have our special guest for this evening, Joel Southall, our fisheries liaison officer who will be available during the Q&A sessions following the presentation. And before I kick it over, we do have a quick poll for the audience. Dave, if you don't mind pushing that out. The question is, how familiar are you with offshore wind energy? And although the first offshore wind farm was built off the coast of Denmark in 1991, offshore wind is still a new uh, concept and industry for most communities in the United States. We're interested to know how familiar this audience is, is with the industry as it helps us craft our materials uh, moving forward. Great. It looks like most of you are in that middle range of knowing some stuff about offshore wind, um, or maybe you just know a little bit, and this event will help further your interests and, and help you learn a little bit more about the industry and our project in particular. We appreciate that feedback. Um, and now I will hand it over to my colleague Dugan to kick off our presentation. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Kelsey. And you know, thank you to you all for joining us tonight. Um, to begin tonight's discussion, I just wanted to start off at a high level um, because to really understand why New England needs offshore wind, you first have to take a look at our regional electric grid. So for those of you that don't know, uh, all six New England states do share a single electric grid, uh, meaning that each one of these states relies on dependable energy coming from numerous sources across the region. Um, over the last decade or so, about two dozen generation facilities across New England have either retired or announced plans to retire. Um, and to put that in perspective, those facilities alone had the capacity to power nearly every single residence in New England, about 5 million homes or so. And these retirements pose a significant risk to the regional electric grid in terms of upholding reliability as well as cost stability. So in order to keep the lights on, so to speak, and maintain reliability across the region, we need to replace these retired facilities with new generation sources. Uh, specifically, there has been a big push to replace these retired facilities with clean renewable sources to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution, increase local energy independence, and improve energy cost stability as well. So offshore wind in particular is slated to play a major role in this transition as one of the most cost-effective and scalable renewable energy sources available. 
Uh, for those of you that don't know, New England is actually home to some of the strongest offshore wind resources anywhere in the world. Uh, so we have a substantial opportunity right off our own coast to power the region with a sustainable source of energy rather than relying on you know, carbon intensive imported fossil fuels as we have historically. Um, next slide. Great. So perhaps one of the most important reasons why we need to transition away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy is the rapidly approaching climate crisis. So climate change is no longer some abstract concept. It's, it's really something that we're already seeing right here at home. Um, in Rhode Island alone, temperatures have increased by more than three degrees in the last century. And over that same period, sections of Aquidneck Island have seen more than a foot of sea level rise. And these trends are not expected to slow down anytime soon. With sea level rise predictions of up to an additional nine feet on, on sections of Aquidneck over the next decade, or sorry, over the next century, as well as a 10 times increase in coastal flooding and a significant increase in the frequency and intensity of heat waves as well. Next slide. So accordingly, Rhode Island has mobilized to do their part in addressing the climate crisis with one of the most ambitious net zero commitments in the United States, 100% renewable by 2033. Now, obviously meeting this goal is not going to be easy. Right now, only about a quarter of our regional electric grid is powered by carbon-free resources. And as Governor McKee mentions in this quote here, offshore wind is going to play an essential role in meeting this goal. And it will not only benefit the environment, but create hundreds, if not thousands of jobs within Rhode Island and really kind of position Rhode Island to be a hub for the offshore wind industry on the Atlantic coast. Uh, relating to the Mayflower Wind Project, these environmental and workforce benefits will also be coupled with significant and direct revenue streams to both the town of Portsmouth, as well as the broader state of Rhode Island for their roles in hosting key project components. Um, and we'll take a closer look at some of these benefits a little bit later on. Uh, next slide. So regionally, uh, the offshore wind project area is located off the coast of New England, southern New England in particular. All these projects alone are capable of powering approximately 8.5 million homes. So that's every single home in New England, as well as a substantial percentage of our commercial and industrial energy demands as well. And to harness this energy potential and bring it to shore will require billions of dollars in investment within the region, create tens of thousands of jobs across a variety of sectors like manufacturing, construction, operations and maintenance, as well as in supporting industries like hospitality, food and fuel and maritime services, all contributing to a stronger and more diverse blue economy within the region. So the Southern New England states are actively procuring the electricity that will be generated by these products offshore uh, with around 4,700 megawatts set to be delivered to the region between Massachusetts, Connecticut and Rhode Island. Rhode Island and Massachusetts in particular are in the process of soliciting additional agreements. Just last month, Rhode Island signed legislation seeking an additional 600 to 1,000 megawatts of offshore wind, which would be the state's largest procurement of renewable energy to date and a significant contribution towards the state's 100% renewable goal. Massachusetts is also taking similar steps. So this really kind of goes to show that these states are recognizing the need for robust renewable energy and the need for offshore wind to meet both their economic and climate goals in that regard. Next slide. So Mayflower Wind in particular is slated to be one of the largest contributors to, towards New England's clean energy goals. Um, our lease area is located about 30 miles south of Martha's Vineyard and has a generation potential of about 2,400 megawatts, which is enough to power more than a million homes in the region. So to put that in perspective, to meet that same amount of renewable energy capacity through other means, residential solar, for example, you would need to put solar installations on about 500,000 homes or every single home in Rhode Island, including individual apartments. So we're really looking at a unique opportunity with a massive amount of potential for both emissions reductions and renewable energy generation, as well as you know, bolstering local industries and workforce. And it would be quite difficult to meet the same amount of carbon reductions and renewable energy generation through other means other than offshore wind and opportunities like the Mayflower Project. 
So the project, uh, the power generated by the Mayflower Wind offshore area will tie into the electric grid via two points of interconnection. The first project slated to deliver about half of that capacity or about 1200 megawatts is the Mayflower Wind South Coast project, which will connect to the grid in Somerset, Massachusetts at Brayton Point. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, Brayton Point is actually a former coal plant site on Mount Hope Bay, and it is historically regarded as one of the dirtiest coal plants in America, but is now slated to be home to the clean renewable energy generated by offshore wind. Um, you may have heard that President Biden visited Brayton Point just a couple of weeks ago to talk about just that and to really highlight the important role that this area of southern New England is playing in the clean energy transition as the national hub for offshore wind. Mayflower's second delivery project is slated to connect in Falmouth, Massachusetts on Cape Cod, pending additional procurements for the remaining 1200 megawatts of potential in Mayflower's offshore lease area. So the electricity generated by these projects will tie into the regional electric grid, where it will be available for use by residents all over New England, regardless of where that power comes ashore. Uh, today, we're primarily going to focus on the Mayflower South Coast project as it pertains to Rhode Island. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to my colleague, Lawrence Mott, Mayflower's Transmission Development Manager, to provide a little bit more detail about the project. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you, Dugan. I appreciate it. Um, to the audience, I want to run through fairly uh, quickly on the next set of slides uh, and then get to your questions. Uh, some of you have seen these slides previously, but I really want to hit the points. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I want to cover this area. You are looking on the right-hand side, the uh, Rhode Island jurisdiction in the medium blue. And then the dark blue is the definition of the activity zone. Uh, when Mayflower uh, submits its original definition of the project, we define the outside borders. So that uh, large dark blue area um, is that activity area. The actual cable itself will be in a very small portion of that. We will be coming in from the ocean into Narragansett Bay and up the Sakonet uh, and working within uh, the limitations of ledges, boulders, and the proper uh, soil conditions because we want to bury the cable in a uh, deep, uh, deeply into the riverbed uh, below so that the conditions of the seabed go back the way they were. Uh, the various organisms, entities living there can regenerate and go back to its uh, normal state. And importantly, to keep the cable uh, buried because these cables can last decades uh, once they're installed and uh, beneath any uh, possible interference from uh, anchoring or dragging or other types of activities. Uh, I think it's important to note uh, a few other items in that the cable laying uh, period itself coming up the river is, is more of an installation uh, period of days, week. It's, it's not months. Uh, a cable laying vessel would come up. We'd use uh, the most suitable and uh, best available technology, whether that's uh, water jets and other types of plows that just make the very narrow uh, slot for the cable to fall into. And then the sediment uh, goes back into that trench. Uh, I think the uh, picture on the bottom is indicative in that note, the cable bundle itself. So there are two cables. Uh, those are the power cables and then a communications cable you can see in the top center. Uh, that is about 13 inches uh, for both, all three cables. So the actual uh, width of this bundle is as stated, fairly small and uh, will settle in for long-term use. I'd note the uh, traverse through uh, Rhode Island is fair, fairly short compared to the overall route. And then you'll see the highlight there crossing Portsmouth. We'll get to that in more detail in a moment. Uh, I think an important to highlight is uh, existing infrastructure. We've done a significant amount of studies. There is a natural gas line uh, lower on the Sakonet River some water lines and other infrastructure that we've been in communication with the uh, various uh, owners, responsible authorities on those and would 
implement a very clear plan on how we would cross those without any interruption in service. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's important here to just highlight that uh, Mayflower has conducted a comprehensive set of studies. Uh, many of these are complete. Uh, many are ongoing. Uh, they're publicly available. You can find them via uh, our website and or uh, a variety of the regulators uh, sites and the data that we publish uh, for the process. Uh, permitting and going through the whole design and implementation of a project such as this, uh, it takes years. And these studies uh, are sourced very locally for the very specific conditions and also bringing in best science uh, best uh, actions and, and lessons learned from around the world in this fairly new uh, set of offshore wind studies, combined with the fact that a lot of the work we're doing here is uh, very traditional, i.e. burying electric cables is not a new science. Uh, and there's a lot uh, that we can reference to make sure it's done properly. Uh, next slide. Go on to highlight here is that there are a variety of routes from the Western uh, route, which you may be familiar with, is the current project that's moving through permitting called Rev Wind, Revolution Wind, the West Passage. And then uh, as you move east in green, the East Passage. These are some uh, considerations and, and studies that we undertook in engaging with stakeholders, uh, CRMC, uh, Navy, uh, Coast Guard, a variety of groups to really ensure that we were bringing in uh, the right and most sensible uh, route to consider. Um, this really has taken us to our current preferred path uh, up the Sakonet. Um, the East Passage was, was of interest. Uh, the Navy uh, would prefer that we were not in front of their facilities. And uh, in the upper part of Narragansett Bay, uh, there are a lot of rocks, uh, some shallow areas and difficulties uh, getting in through there. The route on Mount Hope Bay itself uh, is fairly straightforward. We would pass on the west side to avoid the, Ar avoid the Army Corps uh, dredge channel. And the focus uh, for many of you in Portsmouth is discuss really this whole portion of the Sakonet River and also up into the top of the Sakonet here and the crossing. So we'll get into that in the next slides. Next, please. This, uh, these images are really focused on the highlighting some of the concerns of why people ask, uh, are you not able to just continue up the Sakonet River? Uh, this is something that the project has continued to study. Uh, we look for the best options and lowest risk. I think to highlight the issues of why we have chosen to uh, look at an overland route across the top of a quidneck rather than continuing through the bridge is it's a high risk uh, area. The, uh, it is narrow, it is deep. There are would be requirement for removing debris where the old rail bridge uh, was uh, demolished and taken down uh, also adjacent the old uh, uh, traffic bridge adjacent Route 24, as well as significant changes in depth. If you look at the inserts in the uh, benthic or uh, imagery of the river, you can see how the depth changes in a very sh short distance. So the ability to bury cable, again, we wanna bury the cable to get it out of any risks so it can operate uh, without any maintenance required for years, decades. Uh, this gets to be a challenging in the additional factor that the river has very hard bottom. This portion of the river, down uh, south of this, it's more uh, softer, muddier silt. Right here is a very hard bottom. So in conclusion, the high risk in a hard bottom with uh, likely uh, dredging required to remove debris, which can uh, in create turbidity and other environmental conditions impacting commercial recreational uses of the river is why we're here uh, in Portsmouth. Next slide, please. This uh, 
slide shows the tools that we will be using, uh, horizontal directional drilling, HDD. And you can uh, see the whole idea of having a drill rig by the cursor and literally drilling as you would uh, with any type of a drill, but directional drilling means that we can actually direct it down and underneath the coastal surface. So in the case of uh, the south end of Boyd's Lane, we can drill underneath Park Avenue, underneath the uh, sidewalk, boardwalk, underneath the beach, and underneath the moorings in this portion of the bay, and then surface offshore. So we would surface, uh, depending on the final design, approximately 15 feet, 100 feet, 1500 feet south of the uh, low tide line. And that would then continue in the typical burial method where we would bury the cable in the silt. These HDDs are exactly that. They're, they're a conduit, which would be lined with a casing and uh, they can be drilled and then capped and stay in that um, ready to have the cable, which in the lower slide, you can see there's the actual cable lay vessel where the cable is spooled. And that would in effect have the cable pulled through this conduit and up onto the shore with a winch. At that point, the cable would go into a vault uh, similar to a large concrete uh, tub uh, say 10 feet by uh, 15 feet, and that's where the cables would be spliced. And then you would uh, convert to a on land trenching uh, and proceed up Boyd's Lane. I think a few other highlights of this slide are the fact that uh, you, can, uh, you don't have to interrupt any of the use of the area. Uh, moorings can continue to uh, work uh, in this area, so you're not interrupting the use of the moorings, and that the uh, vaults I mentioned, those are flush, so there's no above ground facilities uh, when you're done, and that if you need to access this for maintenance, you are working from these endpoints, not from over the top, so you're never working uh, over the beach or any of these areas. Next slide, please. So in detail, uh, to highlight a, a fairly busy slide, but I think the takeaways is here we are at the south end of Boyd's Lane, where at Park Avenue. This uh, line right here is what I just showed on the previous slide of the horizontal directional drill. And you can see a little bit of the white highlight, the boomerang, uh, on the north side of Park Avenue, where we would set up the drilling equipment and work in a very defined uh, construction atmosphere. Uh, that construction area would have uh, sound deadening uh, curtains around it. We would work with uh, the town of Portsmouth and others to develop the right uh, traffic pattern. Uh, that's really only interrupting one lane for some short periods. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so your traffic can still move through. We could perceive uh, defined hours so that we're not interrupting people uh, out of uh, normal business hours. I think uh, you can also take a look at the route going through the existing infrastructure, and we'll take a more detailed look through the 3D model, but you can highlight the Mount Hope Bridge route, which would then go by the bridge abutments or foundations and enter into Mount Hope Bay, also using horizontal directional drilling or utilizing the existing uh, N-Grid, the utility uh, N-Grid originally, now PPL uh, line, which would have a horizontal directional drill going underneath wetlands. And then our preferred routes, which are these two to the east, uh, going underneath the golf course. Uh, and these would be well under the golf course, probably uh, 40 to 80 feet under, uh, not disturbing any of the features and all the construction would uh, occur outside uh, any of that uh, fragile infrastructure, such as utilizing the uh, Roger Williams lands or uh, the parking area here near Montauk. Next slide. Let's uh, have Dugan take us on a tour 
and get a few more features. And uh, we also will uh, pause at the end of this um, 3D effort to give you a chance to ask any clarifying questions. You're now uh, looking at the actual lease area that was described previously with the turbines. The turbines are spaced one mile apart. These, this spacing was in consultation with the uh, fishing community, uh, Coast Guard, uh, Army Corps and others, and BOEM to ensure that we would allow for uh, navigational and uh, the existing uses uh, of the area. And you can see above uh, to the right is Nantucket, to almost the center, left of center is Martha's Vineyard and then Cape Cod and then off to your left, the bluish is uh, up in Narragansett. So we'll traverse towards Portsmouth. As you've previously seen, this is the cable route heading from federal waters and into uh, Rhode Island waters. Again, uh, a significant amount of survey work done to found a, find a suitable route that avoids uh, the uh, most pr productive fishing areas that uh, works around the various uh, features underwater to correctly bury the cable. Uh, as noted, we look to bury the cable at target depth of six feet, and that's usually anywhere from four to 13 feet, depending on the uh, composition of the sea bottom. So we're traversing up uh, and entering into the Sakonet and uh, we'll be finding the exact route uh, that will come out in further uh, detailed design efforts, utilizing the survey data we have and engaging with stakeholders. And arriving uh, now, you can see ahead is Gould Island. And at this point, we can pause to look at the narrow area of the Sakonet at the top, uh, the old stone bridge, and uh, further to the north, uh, the three bridges, the old railroad bridge, the old route, the old uh, crossing, and then the current Route 24 bridge. So this gives you further uh, view to the uh, difficulty of passing. I think uh, many of you uh, either utilize or, or see the area adjacent Teddy Beach um, on the south edge, and then underneath Route 24 at the boat ramp uh, of that particularly confined area with the strong tidal currents. I think it's important to note that this route avoids really Island Park. You see Island Park off to your right. Uh, it's nowhere near the old landfill and it is uh, utilizing the Boyd's Lane to stay right on the edge of the road. Um, as noted in the magenta, that's the HDD as we've previously seen. And then we can uh, progress up Boyd's Lane uh, on the east side, staying away from residences and having the drill equipment down here right at the edge. Um, we might pause a moment to think about timing. Uh, we intend to do this work in uh, the winter season, uh, kind of the November through uh, March. Uh, we're not gonna be working in the, the summer, uh, more uh, higher use. We would, uh, as I noted, some of the uh, daylight hours working and you could assume that this installation might be a couple of months to complete the first phase of all the drilling activities and cleaning the site up. And then the following year, we would come back and pull the cable in. The pulling of the cable would be um, a much, uh, shall we say, lesser activity because we'd just be removing the vault tops, manhole covers, and uh, pulling that cable. I think we've all seen some of the fiber optics pulled uh, on the side of the road in a pretty regular basis the last few years. These would be similar. It's just gonna be larger cable and it would be pulled into these trenches and duct banks. And this red line would uh, be buried with a concrete slurry and covering the cable up. That keeps the cable safe and it also uh, ensures that the uh, EMF or any electrical characteristics are uh, buried deep and absolutely minimized. We pause here to show the Mount Hope uh, Bay route uh, off to the northwest and the HDD going in adjacent the uh, bridge, Mount Hope Bridge, and then continuing up uh, the bay. If you look uh, down lower, you can see where our intention is to turn right and head down Anthony Road. Uh, that's uh, 
state uh, Rhode Island DOT land and then, uh, pardon me, road, and then it converts to town of Portsmouth Road after the uh, old state um, sand storage. So this gives you just a flavor for the ideas of where we would locate the drilling equipment, similar to the southern end on Boyd's Lane by Park Avenue. We would have this drill equipment and we would then drill the HDDs out. And these would surface beyond moorings and uh, then connect and be buried to the sea cable heading up to Brayton Point. The uh, intention is to have a singular crossing and stay on the west side of the Army Corps uh, dredged area to allow for any traffic uh, to continue up to Fall River. And then our preference is to go to the northwest here on the Lee River, where we would go in and then conduct an HDD uh, from this point and come ashore uh, through the riprap and use the existing uh, roads at Brayton Point where we would uh, bury the cable to a converter station and where we would then connect to uh, Engrid's uh, large point of interconnect, POI, to then distribute the power uh, throughout uh, the area. I might highlight that uh, this is a significant amount of energy, as Dugan mentioned, going into this area, and there are direct transmission lines connecting this Brayton Point facility down into Rhode Island. So a significant portion of the generation of this project will be flowing into Rhode Island. Thank Great. you. Before we um, move away from the 3D tool or we can pull it back up if we need it, we're just gonna pause for a couple of minutes to take a few questions from the audience. Um, the, most of the questions are for you, Lawrence. Um, I'll start with this first one. Um, we received it from a couple of different people in the audience. Can you just reiterate the duration of construction in Portsmouth? It'll be a two part where we would start in one winter where we would conduct the uh, horizontal directional drilling and the trenching alongside the road. And then that is a, let's say a two month process. And then we would come back the following year and take about a month to pull the cables in. Great, thank you. We have another one for, for you, Lawrence. It's a three part question from Jay. He is curious about the cables. Um, so the questions are one, what methods will be used for installation? Two, what methods will be used to protect the cable? And three, what type of cable will be used? Yeah, that's great. If I may, Jay, let's go a little backwards. So the cables themselves are inert. They're mostly copper with some poly and other metal sheathing. There's no oils or, or if I may, odd uh, chemicals in them. Uh, the uh, next question on the types, uh, we'll be using a variety of tools depending on the bottom conditions. I mentioned previously uh, the use of uh, water jets or other tech, uh, plow techniques in these uh, softer sediments so that the cables are buried. I mentioned the target depth to have them uh, down low. If in fact the uh, bottom is hard or there's particular obstacle to get around, we will use a variety of techniques. One of the words used uh, description is mattressing, where you actually put uh, concrete or other type of protection over the cable, uh, and that allows uh, fishing gear to slide over it. Um, actually can be uh, some homes for fishing, and again, uh, protects the cable. And then, uh, what was the last one, Kelsey? What type of cable will we be using? Yeah, I hit that. I did it backwards. So it was the first question then. The first question was what methods will be used for installation? Yeah, so I think I hit methods. Uh, I think I hit all three. You did. And follow up, Jay. Great. Thank you. We have another question from Rhonda who says, my concern as a person with a home on the Sakana in Island Park is whether there will be any EMFs, electric magnetic fields, or other potentially dangerous emissions from these cables. Could you speak to that, Lawrence? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Rhonda. Uh, first of all, of all, we do have a variety of studies that we've conducted 
They are uh, accessible uh, on our website and through the EFSB. Uh, the uh, HVDC, we are using an HVDC technology versus AC. So in our houses, we use AC and our, similar to our cars, we use DC, direct current. The uh, DC uh, has a lesser uh, EMF field. And as I noted, uh, buried uh, the way we'd be installing this cable, uh, you're not gonna have uh, any impacts. It's way below any of the international standards uh, for exposure and way below, if I may, to uh, a lot of the daily exposure we get in, in our lives. Perfect, thank you, Lawrence. We'll do one more question here, but don't worry if I didn't get to your question during this segment, we have a much longer Q&A um, session following the end of the presentation. So this last question, again, for Lawrence, Dan asks, are there particular impacts to the marine environment that you are concerned about in the upper river that you are avoiding by going over land? If so, do those differ from other parts of the Sakonet? I am not aware of uh, anything that I would highlight here. Uh, I think we might follow up in the, in the second round of Q&A. We could pull Joel in on that. Great, thank you. Any thoughts on that, Joel? <clears throat> uh, yeah, sorry, I thought we were gonna wait for the second one, but we can definitely do that. Now that, that works out perfectly. Yeah, so uh, there are differences um, in different parts of the Sakana in, in Mount Hope Bay. Um, a lot of those differences are already known from a lot of really good research that's been done um, by the state, um, by research institutions in the area that we have um, looked at to compile into our construction and operation plan. So the, the long document that describes um, how the project uh, will be built, like what, what Lawrence was talking about, also um, describes the uh, marine environment that you're asking about. Um, and a lot of that data goes in there. And then we've also done a lot of other surveys that we can talk about um, later uh, that also go out to characterize what the area looks like. And there are there are some differences, um, obviously, between different parts um, of the river, but not really anything um, particularly at that area. I think it's a lot more about um, the installation process and um, other um, competing uses right at that area and existing conditions, so. Great, thanks, Joel. And now I'll hand it back to Dugan um, to continue on with our presentation, and then we'll get back to some more questions. Perfect, thank you very much, Kelsey. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Great, so I know we're running a little bit short on time here, so I'll try to go through these last couple of slides pretty quickly, um, but I'm sure one question that many of you in the audience have today is what are the benefits to Portsmouth and you know the greater Rhode Island region um, when the project is said and done? So just to go through some of those benefits quickly, um, first and foremost, the South Coast project alone is slated to create more than 14,000 jobs in the region over the life of the project. And these are both direct and indirect jobs, but one thing that I really wanna highlight is during the operations and maintenance phase, which is the longest uh, period of project operation, 30 years or so, Mayflower has committed to sourcing at least 75% of those jobs here locally. Um, we're opening a brand new operations and maintenance facility in Fall River that's gonna have you know, almost 400 full-time staff. And we're really going to be looking at Rhode Island and Southern Massachusetts to uh, procure those jobs. So that's just one thing I'd like to highlight there. Um, Looking at the offshore cable corridor within the Sakonet and Mount Hope Bay, the state of Rhode Island will receive several million dollars in submerged land lease fees. Um, and similarly for the brief onshore stretch in Portsmouth, the town will also receive significant financial compensation. So this revenue for the town could take a number of forms, right? Whether it be taxes or payment in lieu of taxes or other means. Um, this is something that is going to be decided collaboratively with the town. So, you know, we're relatively early in the planning process right now. We're having ongoing conversations with the town to, to really determine what form of, you know, uh, payment or you know, other means of, of benefits to the town would be most beneficial for uh, the residents such as yourself. Um, a couple other things I just want to highlight quickly is um, 
the benefits to the supply chain, right? So the supply chain in Portsmouth and greater Rhode Island will also benefit through, again, millions of dollars in project spending on things like services and materials, uh, use of local ports and vessels, uh, as well as expenditure at local businesses. So just last month, Mayflower actually announced our new partnership with Supply RI, which is a initiative of the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation. And this partnership is really, uh, it was formed to aid in our targeted, targeted procurement of goods and services specifically from Rhode Island based companies. Um, and Ro Supply RI is just one of our local partnerships, right? We're also working closely with local academic institutions like Roger Williams and URI, both to share knowledge as well as help establish a pipeline for those local students to find careers themselves in the local offshore wind industry. Um, we're also members of the Portsmouth Business Association, and we've recently uh, partnered with Clean Ocean Access as well. Um, in fact, this weekend on Saturday, we will be uh, supporting one of Clean Ocean Access's events right here on the island in Newport. And the event is really just fundraising to uh, help support their mission of protecting ocean and beach resources exclusively here on Equidnet. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Again, I'll try to go through this pretty quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. But just to briefly touch on the permitting process, really the main message I wanted to get across here is that the U.S. offshore wind industry is held to extremely rigorous regulatory requirements, um, significantly more so than a lot of other energy uh, sources. So Mayflower Wind in particular, for example, will require about 60 permits from 30 different regulatory agencies at the federal, state, and local levels before any construction can begin. So this long and comprehensive permitting process really creates a system of checks and balances, and it really demands extensive communication and collaboration between Mayflower as a developer and these diverse facets of federal, state, and local government. Um, as Lawrence mentioned earlier, part of this permitting process is our surveying and research, right? So we've conducted extensive environmental and socioeconomic analyses, and we continue to do so. Um, in fact, our surveying to date represents some of the most comprehensive research that has been done within the Sakana and Mount Hope Bay so that we can continue to make well-informed decisions in our project proposals. Um, and this is, of course, not something that we're doing in a silo, right? In addition to our own surveys and analyses, we're working closely with environmental groups and academic institutions and technical experts that are really well-versed in these local ecosystems, as well as the intersection of renewable energy and the environment in general. Um, just go to the next slide. Um, and part of this collaboration and, and these communications with the broader audiences is our engagement with the fishing community, right? So obviously recognizing in Rhode Island that fisheries play a massive role in the local blue economy. Uh, Mayflower regularly engages with the industry to collect feedback and distribute information, field questions. Um, You've already met Joel, who is our full-time fishery liaison officer, whose sole role at Mayflower is to continue interacting with this community and making sure they're heard and informed and that our final project design works for them. Um, Kelsey and myself are the onshore equivalent of that, right? So our sole purpose is to engage with any and all community members that want to speak with us about the project. So both of our contact information is listed on the website. And you know, we're always available if you wanna have a phone call or sit down for a conversation, if you want us to present to your community group, really we're just here to collect your input, field your questions and make sure that everyone is informed as, as possible. Um, we can just go to the last slide here. So I just wanted to end quickly on our project timeline before we go to the Q&A. Um, so just to give you a sense of where we're at with the project, we acquired our offshore lease area back in 2019 and have been in the permitting and surveying phase since that point. So as I mentioned earlier, we currently have contracts for about 1200 megawatts uh, slated to be delivered to Brayton Point and onshore construction is slated to kick off in late 2024, early 2025 or so, uh, followed by the offshore construction later uh, that year. So altogether, we're looking at delivering power to the grid by 2028. That is to say, we're still quite early in the process. Um, there will be a lot more opportunities for community members like yourselves to you know, submit input and ask questions. We're, we're here to listen and, and make sure that this project really is beneficial for all involved. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me or Kelsey or Joel anytime, um, you know, or you can uh, attend one of our upcoming events. So as I mentioned, you know, we will be in Newport on Saturday. You can stop by and have a conversation with us if you'd like. We also have our uh, 
preliminary EFSB hearing on Thursday. So these are just a couple of opportunities where citizens like yourselves, stakeholders in general, can you know, speak and, and ask questions and, and provide your input for the project. Um, so that being said, I, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. And with that, I'll hand it off to Kelsey for the Q&A portion just to wrap things up tonight. Great. Thanks, Dugan. Now's the time to answer some more of your questions. We have received a lot of questions, so we'll get to as many as we can. First one is for Lawrence from Wendy. She asked, um, Lawrence mentioned the routes beneath the golf course were preferred routes, but did not go into the reason why. Please elaborate why these routes were preferred over the other two shown. Uh, good question. Uh, I think the, the answer is it avoids residential areas. Uh, it is the ability to minimize uh, the congestion around Mount Hope uh, Bridge uh, for the difficulties or shall I say uh, obstacles in that route and also avoiding any of the uh, difficulties around the end grid path. So it's basically scores higher and is a better uh, use and less disruption. Great, thank you, Lawrence. Here is one for Rich that I think Joel should take and maybe Lawrence, you can hop in. He asks, why land at Brayton Point, or why land at Brayton Point given that the Sakonet River is an area heavily used by recreational fishing and other activities? The Sakonet has been designated by the New England Fishery Management Council as an inshore juvenile cod habitat area of particular concern. If Brayton Point is required, why not go over land? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll definitely handle the, the first part of that. Um, so one of the things we were talking about earlier is, so uh, in the construction and operations plan, um, an analysis of existing data, and then also looking at the surveys that Mayflower is doing, um, all of the developers go through a process with National Marine Fisheries Service where we do an essential fish habitat consultation, um, where we put all of that um, information together. And some of the information for uh, for the surveys that we get is really, really fine scale information. And so the, the maps that Lawrence was showing earlier, where you look at the cable corridor going up, the, you know, the individual cable is really small within that, but the, the cable corridor is bigger. We survey that entire route and get really uh, good data for that that goes into that essential fish habitat consultation um, that I was talking about earlier. And we're, we're in the data analysis portion of that right now. So some of those surveys wrapped up fairly recently we're analyzing that right now. And so it's all preliminary um, and it's still being done. Like as we as we speak, there's still more analysis to do, but pre preliminary results um, look at the Sakonet and see um, primarily um, muds and, and fine sands. Um, so within the HAPC that Rich was asking about, and I was actually looking through the, the um, Q&A earlier, I saw Greg was asking a question um about the inshore juvenile cod HAPC so thanks for thanks for asking that um Greg as well so a lot of what we're seeing from the surveys um are muds and fine sands um and and not necessarily the, the sort of um, bottom types that that actually go into what constitutes um HAPC so again that's ongoing it's preliminary uh, but that's a, a lot of what we've seen thank you Joel I might anything just... to add Okay. Uh, add a little bit that uh, uh, we, as a, a large project injecting power into the New England grid, are limited in how many options we have. So we continue to look at how we can uh, land this power on the Cape uh, and inject that and get it off the Cape and to the load centers. And also, uh, Brayton represents a very significant uh, uh, backbone or robust part of the transmission to get that power ashore and to the load. Thanks, Lawrence. Here is a question from Matthew. What are the expected traffic impacts on the common commute traffic between Route 24 and 114? I would say uh, they're gonna be minimal. Uh, at the moment, we assume, as I noted, that we would uh, really work within suitable hours. We could assume that uh, rush hour traffic uh, may not be uh, allowed, uh, or pardon me, we may not be allowed to conduct construction activities during rush hour, and also that uh, we would keep equipment uh, to the edge or in one lane. Great, thank you, Lawrence. And I, just, to, just to add on that quickly. Um, so 
the traffic management plan is is one of the requirements of a project like this and that's something that we will collaborate with the town with right so obviously nobody knows the traffic patterns better than you know the people of the town itself so um the town will collaborate with us to help map out exactly you know when those periods of construction should be um i would also like to add that you know as lawrence mentioned we'll primarily be working on shoulders and you know potentially one lane um that no point I, is it anticipated that we would need to close an entire road or anything along those lines we would essentially have rolling closures right so 100 feet 200 feet or so um at a time so really it should be you know small points of congestion at you know opportune times and again that's something that we would uh, iron out with the town thanks dugan here is another question for lawrence from nancy how deep is the underground overland in portsmouth um, and how much clearance is required to cross with other utilities? Maybe you can speak about how we kind of plan our project um, around other utilities like sewer, telecom, et cetera. Yeah, uh, thank you, Nancy. And yes, this is part of the ongoing uh, review. Uh, Rhode Island DOT, as well as the town, will require a full inventory of the existing infrastructure. And then we will consult with those entities as well as the town and Rhode Island DOT to consider the best methods to cross. Uh, as regarding depth, uh, we could assume that the cables will be anywhere from uh, four to six, possibly seven feet. Uh, again, you may go deeper at a particular crossing and then uh, come back up again. This will be uh, determined through the final design. Thank you, Lawrence. Here's a question for Joel. Um, Aaron asks, will Mayflower have an assigned detail to monitor and manage boat traffic during the cable lay process? Yeah, that's a, a really important question, especially um, at peak times um, for some of the surveys. We've, we've already done a lot of that um, coordination out there for, for recreational boating, for recreational commercial fishing. Um, you know, all the marine traffic out there, it's really important to coordinate that. So the, the, the vessels that we've had a little bit of both, so we've had sort of pre-scouting for looking at fishing areas to, to manage that, that side of things. And then, um, had, uh, the, the staff on the, on the survey vessels do that. And we'll have a, a similar approach, um, for construction as well. So really professional crews operating, um, their vessels safely, uh, that's, that's a big aspect of it is that, um, coordination with other with other boaters. Thanks, Joel. Here's one for Dugan um, that we've received uh, from a few different audience members, Perry, Abby, a few others. Um, can you reiterate what the benefits to Portsmouth residents will be from this project and you know, just the local benefits in general? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So yeah, I know I had to go over those kind of quickly, so I appreciate you asking again. Um, so in terms of the most direct benefit, right, there will be direct revenue for the town. Again, this is the form that that revenue takes is still kind of being ironed out and, and the town will more or less determine what form they would like to receive payment in. And, and obviously ongoing negotiations will kind of determine some of those details, but that's the most direct form, right? Um, but Taking a little bit more of a regional lens, there's a lot of regional benefits to Rhode Island. I mentioned the significant workforce that we're going to need to staff. These are jobs that don't exist currently. The offshore wind is really in its new stages here, so we're really looking to ramp up the the workforce in that capacity, as well as you know utilize existing skill sets in the area. Um, the supply chain within Rhode Island as well. Uh, if any of you have been following uh, offshore wind news within Rhode Island more and more manufacturing facilities and and multiple developers beyond just Mayflower are really kind of basing themselves in Rhode Island and, and again kind of creating those jobs. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, grid reliability right so as soon as these electrons hit the regional grid anyone in New England can access them and that really helps feed into reliability of the grid it helps uh, make the grid a little bit cleaner so that helps with the you know, air, air quality and water quality as well as meeting you know, Rhode Island state goals like hitting that 100% uh, renewable mark. Again, it's something to, to cover over a, a, a 20 minute conversation rather than a two minute snippet here. So please feel free to shoot me an email if, if you're looking for a little bit more detail there, but hopefully that provides some insight. Thanks, Dugan. Here's a quick one for Lawrence from Allen. Um, what will ultimately determine which entry into Mount Hope Bay will be selected? I think it'll be a, a whole combination of factors, uh, discussions with landowners and uh, discussions further with stakeholders 
uh, including the town portion and Rhode Island DOT are the main factors, as well as our uh, permit process that we're in the midst of. Great, thank you. Another quick one from Aaron. Does Mayflower have an approximate date or year when the construction would be performed in Portsmouth? Uh, as outlined in the schedule uh, Dugan presented, the plan would be to begin in the uh, winter of 24-25 uh, and then continue in 26-27. Uh, Again, uh, we're still fairly early. Uh, these points are not yet defined and this is part of our engagement. Thank you, Lawrence. We have one for Joel from Dan. What time of year will the in-water portion take place and how long specifically will it last? Um, speaking to the uh, construction in the Sakonet River. Yeah, um, I actually might uh, steer that to Lawrence. We were talking about that the other day uh, at work. Um, so Great. I will let him handle that. Yeah, as, as mentioned uh, briefly, we could look in terms of uh, a vessel coming up the Sakonet River, a uh, cable laying vessel, if I may, kind of going half a knot, meaning this is a matter of a week or so uh, traversing up. Uh, this is not a long period of time to uh, set and properly uh, install the cables. And then I think I've covered the uh, HDD and the onshore portions. And then similarly in Mount Hope Bay would be, uh, as the river would be progressing with a, a burial method up. Great, thank you, Lawrence. Um, here is a question from Andrew um, regarding the diagram that we um, showed on the slide of, of the other offshore wind developers. The diagram showed multiple offshore leases. The Mayflower project seems to be one of the first ones. Will other developers be seeking to come through this economic um, and will these be coordinated? Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, it's an excellent question. As uh, we have a uh, Massachusetts in, in Rhode Island in its first procurement and now looking at its second procurement uh, is a uh, leader in moving forward with offshore wind. Uh, I would highlight a few things. Uh, the lease areas, uh, some of them are now approaching uh, project uh, bidding, if I may, in New York, uh, Connecticut, uh, other areas. It's not all intended for Rhode Island and Mass. Uh, at the moment, uh, there are only a handful of uh, projects considering uh, the region, such as RevWind and ourselves, and another one in the Brayton Point area. So uh, time will tell. Uh, this is also part of ISR New England and its regulatory process and how they establish interconnection queue and accepting a uh, injection. So we are uh, somewhat beholden to the regulatory process as are the other leaseholders and who will uh, secure a connection and who will therefore want to come and connect to Brayton. Great, thanks Lawrence. Um, we're running out of time. We have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, this is another one for Lawrence from Thomas. How does Mayflower relate to National Grid in the new power company, Rhode Island Energy? Are we a subcontractor? Will Rhode Island Energy distribute the electricity to Rhode Island? How does Mayflower Wind relate to the utility companies that we know? Yeah, good question. Uh, let me start at the top. Uh, the state of Massachusetts had a policy to uh, renewable portfolio standard to therefore uh, bring in renewable energy. And they, the legislature, directed the utilities, such as NGRID, to procure offshore wind. The uh, RFPs were issued, we were a winner, and we did have a contract with NGRID. It's a power purchase agreement to deliver the uh, energy to uh, NGRID, and they compensate us for that energy delivered, and then they are in charge of it once it's uh, delivered to their point of interconnect, and they're responsible to distribute it uh, and uh, deal with all of the renewable energy credits and all the other uh, factors uh, of that energy. Uh, PPL uh, now is a separate entity and uh, we have no formal relationship with them. And we right. have no, no uh, uh, as I say, uh, NGRID is a customer. We're not, no, nothing to do with NGRID. Thanks for that clarity, Lawrence. And we are just at 7.30. My apologies if we did not get to your question tonight. We did receive a lot. 
please feel free to email us any follow-up questions to info at mayflowerwind.com or call the number on the slide that you're about to see on your screen. Um, I do wanna mention that we appreciate the comments made on terminology and climate figures that were offered. We do take all of these comments into consideration. Um, as Dugan mentioned, we will be at our booth in person at Clean Ocean Access's Paddle for Access event this Saturday, August 20th in Newport. We'd be happy to chat with any of you in person. We'd also like to urge you to follow us on our social media pages displayed here, as well as subscribe for our newsletter to stay informed about any project updates and future events like this one. When the Zoom call ends in just a few moments, you will see a link pop up that prompts you to fill out a very quick survey. It's just three questions. We would very much appreciate a few minutes of everyone's time to fill it out to help inform our future events for the Portsmouth community. And we look forward to your feedback. Um, from all of us at Mayflower Win, we'd like to thank you again for joining us tonight and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you.